Welcome to the roundtable of the new books in the history of women philosophers. I am Jill Müller, deputy head of the Center for the History of Women Philosophers and Scientists. And today I'm warmly welcome Pier Giacomo Severini and Christian Barth. Pier Giacomo Severini is the author of the book Being is Doing With, Freedom and Existence in Jan Hersch. He graduated in philosophical sciences at the University of Mascherata. He was a visiting PhD student at the University of Zurich and earned his PhD title in human sciences at University Gabriele D'Annunzio of Chieti Pescara in 2021 with the additional title of De Dr. Europeus. Professor Christian Bard is program manager of philosophy at Schwabe Verlag, and he was a helping hand during the edition of this book. Welcome to you both. Pier Giacomo Severini's book, Being is Doing With, published in 2022 at Schwabe Verlag, is an introduction to Jean Hersch's philosophy. As it is mentioned on the back cover, the book is holding together her biography and her philosophy, and is showing in which sense the whole path can be seen as continuous endeavor to guarantee better conditions for the exercise of freedom to more and more people. Thanks to the investigation of Hersch's reflection on freedom throughout all her life, the reader should gain a tool to orient in the heterogeneous Hessian past. In addition, reconstructing the evolution of Hersch's reflection on freedom also highlights the coherence among her varied engagements and texts, shedding new light on some of her minor contributions, which are still quite unknown. Those Jan Hersch's philosophy turns out to be a consistent contribution to existentialism and contemporary issues. So many thanks Pier Giacomo Severini and Christian Barth to have accepted to discuss about the book and its creation. I would start with the first question for Pier Giacomo. What sparked your interest in Jan Hersch or what inspired you about her that you decided to write a book about his philosopher? Well, uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Gia, for proposing and organizing this conversation. Uh, and thank you for your question, of course. Mm, well, uh, I came to know about Jan Hersch uh, really by chance. <laughs> You know, uh, at secondary school, at university, uh, I was studying Spinoza uh, and his statement that uh, freedom coincides with necessity. Uh, so I was saying, uh, um, how is it possible that freedom coincides with necessity? Uh, if someone can explain me how this is possible, this someone, this philosopher will have my attention. So I just uh, typed on Google, I searched, uh, about uh, philosophers who were saying that freedom coincides with necessity and <laughs> that's how uh, I met Chanel, so it's really by chance. Uh, but uh, I have to say uh, now that I studied uh, really deeply her thought uh, that the gradualist theory of freedom uh, that uh, she draws in her path uh, really convinced me that freedom coincides with necessity and uh, it also helped me uh, to clarify many issues related to freedom and also to avoid, um, you know, a, a naive approach to freedom, especially distinguishing between freedom and the free will, uh, which probably is the most common uh, error that we can make when, when dealing with, uh, with freedom. Um, also, I have to say that uh, Hersch proved to be relevant to my research as well. And because, you know, uh, I'm interested in uh, philosophical testimonies rather than theories, uh, philosophical testimonies that reflect concretely and give relevance uh, to the practical implications of theoretical reflections. And this is the main reason why I'm mostly interested in existentialism. Mm, I am convinced uh, that attitude is everything when you do philosophy. And because in philosophy, you can move from a similar starting points and yet and still reach different conclusions depending on the attitude that moves you. Uh, so yeah, I was inspired by Hersch's attitude uh, among existentialists, among existential philosophers, uh, because uh, her philosophy uh, moves from a desire of restitution Hersch says that she feels this desire of restitution of the richness and the depth that we encounter in the world. And um, it somehow recalls uh, Plato and the myth of the cave uh, when the philosopher 
uh, comes back to the cave in order to announce to the other what he saw outside of the cave, even if he knows that he will die for it, for this. Um, also on a personal level, um, Hersch realism, um, both as an attention to reality and an attention uh, to practical implications of theoretical reasoning, this realism helped me a lot in my life uh, because uh, to Hersch, being uh, is doing, uh, and well, this is also a part of the title of the book. Uh, Hersch says that uh, in existence, uh, you always have to do. Um, and uh, I think that this is powerful uh, to philosophers because, well, <laughs> philosophers are famous for overthinking. Uh, instead, Hersch says that even when you don't know how uh, how to do, even when you don't know precisely the way, when you feel unsafe, afraid, uh, when you cannot find a shelter, um, you still have to do something. Uh, and then um, you will free that you are not wasting time. Uh, things will, will get clearer along the way. Then, well, uh, generally speaking, uh, such testimony is still widely unknown, uh, but it is really a good model to me. It is an exemplary model uh, of how to fight what Hirsch defines anemia of being, um, which is a common phenomenon uh, in our time and also other philosophers um, reflected on this. For example, uh, Simone Weil, uh, who defines this uprootedness, which is also the title of one of her main works. Um, we often tend to forget our natural bonds, our social, historical bonds, uh, and the importance of doing something concrete in our life. Uh, Hersch always remembered this uh, in all her practical commitments. And she loved to say uh, that the most important thing is uh, being present in, uh, in one's time. And yeah, uh, the, this is really relevant to me. Yeah, perfect. One reads in your introduction that Hersch's work are found almost exclusively in Switzerland. Hersch is just one example among many contemporary and historical female philosophers whose works are difficult to access. So how complicated was it to uncover her works or to locate them before you could start the actual research? And how complicated was your research per se? Well, this touch is an essential point. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, you're right. Uh, the works from Hersch are found almost exclusively in Switzerland. Um, just the most famous works from Hersch are available out of Switzerland. And they have been translated uh, mainly in German and Italian, uh, except for Ideologie Realité, uh, which is translated just in German. And then some minor works uh, like short articles or the acts of big conferences to which uh, Hersch attended. And they are scattered around Swiss libraries, mainly in Zurich, uh, in Bern and Geneva. Mm. Then uh, you have uh, other unpublished articles, personal documents, notes, reports, which are all kept at the Nachlass Janersch uh, at uh, the Central Library of Zurich. Uh, and of course, then you have uh, some critical literature, um, essentially from uh, European academics, uh, uh, from France, Switzerland, of course, Germany, uh, Italy, and Spain. But the essential point is that uh, Hersch's production is extremely fragmentary, because on the one hand, uh, she contributed to many fields um, like, like education, politics, human rights, uh, medicine, sciences, and she committed to many pressing issues in her time. Uh, and on the other hand, her minor contributions act as a hing, and you know, they connect her major uh, contributions because sometimes uh, they introduce a specific term, other times they introduce a relevant category, or maybe they contain a practical example, which is particularly fruitful, stuff like this. Before going to Switzerland, I was able to collect Hare's major works, of course, plus some minor works um, which had been analyzed in critical literature recently, so they were already quite famous. Um, and I was also able to collect some critical literature. Mm. In my book, Acknowledgements, uh, I talk of the valuable cooperation network that helped me to undertake my, my research. 
uh, I think that we are progressing really fast in knowledge and research. Uh, so before going to Switzerland, uh, I already knew where to search the text and the libraries and the centers sent me the text really fast. So I have to say a really a big thank to them uh, because this helped me a lot. And I didn't spend too much time for collecting the text once I was in Switzerland. Uh, nevertheless, yes, I have to say that I spent some months for finding the exact locations of some texts and of course to write down a good and complete bibliography. In my introduction, I also devote some pages uh, to the actual research on women philosophers in general. And also here, uh, I, should, I would say that we are progressing fast, uh, finally, I would say, uh, but uh, a women's contribution is still largely unintegrated because for centuries uh, we ignored that they reflected on philosophical issues, they collaborated with uh, famous male colleagues, they took part in groups, circles, and associations. Um, we have to promote this dissemination. We have to promote this, the dissemination of such contribution, especially, I would say, with translations and critical editions. Uh, and also, um, we need the time just for stepping in their ideas uh, for familiarizing with them and comparing them with different parties, uh, both from philosophical and not philosophical fields, of course. Mm. In Hirsch's case, uh, my book, this introduction in English, uh, is the very first step, I would say, mm, in order to understand the most important passages of her work and her life as well, and uh, to clarify, uh, how her different thoughts and commitments intertwine. Mm, but now there is a lot of stuff that we still have to do because we have uh, to clarify her debts towards her main references. So uh, first of all, Karl Jaspers, who is uh, her mentor, uh, Immanuel Kant, and also Henri Berson, um, especially Henri Berson, I would say, because uh, his influence on Jean Hersch is uh, often underestimated. Uh, then we need to edit uh, her minor works uh, or also publish some critical editions, uh, especially in English, because we still does not have some text in English about her, uh, or at least not English translations. Uh, and finally, we also have to promote, of course, the dialogue uh, with contemporary philosophers, but also with uh, other experts, as I said, uh, from different fields. Mm, I would say, especially uh, in politics and human rights, because Hirsch really says a lot uh, about this. Yeah, you are right. You are mentioning a nice point here, like uh, doing digitalization and promoting the female philosophers' work. That's what we are doing at the center, but we need a lot more of these uh, works yeah, to be indeed. done at least this critical work, this digitalization of the works, because everything is so uh, not so easy to access. And it's really a pity because it's so rich, even on only information and all the depths, you know, uh, um, the female philosophers have to European culture in general. And European culture has that towards female philosophers. One has really to promote this 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 kind of uh, intervention from female thinkers. Yeah, it's a lot of work, but it's a good start. I mean, someone has to start with this, then uh, other people will come helping us. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, and uh, you are several times mentioning the new path Hirsch is taking. I think as it's exactly what uh, is in your in your mind when we speak about female philosophies in general, even. And so I was wondering is if um, philosophy was groundbreaking in the way contemporary women's philosophy should be read, or is she even the key to understand women philosophers in general? You mentioned somewhere the women's sensibility, which is extremely close to existential and phenomenological perspectives that are multiplying in our age. Would this sensibility make the force of women philosophers in your sense? Hmm. This is a, a deep and dense question. So thank you. And first of all, I think uh, I should better clarify this new path that Hersh is taking. Uh, well, to Hersh, uh, freedom is a universal capability uh, of the human being, mm. namely the capability of wanting fully 
what is worthy for us. Uh, thanks to freedom, we can glimpse the transcendent value in an immanent object, says Ash. And this object becomes the matter that we hold thanks to freedom. Uh, this process, says Ash, gives a new form to matter. Uh, because our old cannot penetrate the matter in itself. So we give a subjective form to the matter that we hold. Mm, we can say the form is some aspects of objective matter plus the transcendent value that we can glimpse in it. Mm. In the book, I state that uh, Hirsch's position is a realist existentialism mm, because you know it is a reflection on existence which enhances reality. Rather than being grounded on nothingness, uh, as we can see, for example, in Sartre or other famous existentialist interpretations, um, to Hirsch, existence is grounded on the real objective datum. Um, existence starts from the reality of matter and then comes back to reality for adding something new in the world. Um, which is uh, a form that incarnates, says Ash, uh, a form that incarnates what is worthy for the subject. Um, so this is the main reason to me uh, for Hersch's positive attitude. Um, and I also recalled this positive attitude at the beginning, um, grounding existence on the richness we can encounter in the world um, and with the occasion of giving a subjective form to it, thanks to our freedom, uh, with this all, Hirsch can highlight the aforementioned desire of restitution that animates human existence. And so, yeah, it is in this sense that Hirsch is groundbreaking in an existentialist panorama to me. Mm, furthermore, uh, Hirsch states that we are all free. The relevant question is not if I am free or if I am not free, but how much are we free? Uh, so, to Hirsch, the more we consider the objects we encounter in the world uh, as a matter to which uh, we can give a form. Uh, the more we find in the immanent world, uh, see first, say there, of the transcendent value, and the more our existence is free because it incarnates what we want fully and what is worthy for us. Mm. I conclude in the book that it is in this sense that to have existing and being is doing with and uh, this is exactly the title of my book. Uh, existing is doing, but we have to do with the natural datum. We have to start from the natural datum without creating ex nihilo, uh, and we have to do with the other subjects, because Hirsch always points out that our actions are free only when they do not hurt the freedom of the other. And well, I think that this is a strong testimony today um, because we often consider freedom as the possibility of doing whatever we want, whenever we want, in an absolute way. Here I'm thinking at the Latin word, uh, absolutus, um, which means without limits, literally. Uh, Hirsch clarifies that freedom is rather the opportunity of following our natural or biological tendencies, um, dealing with the limits that belong to our nature and always starting from our active and responsible engagement with the world. And uh, so, yes, this is uh, to me another sense in which Hirsch is groundbreaking for contemporary times. Mm, besides these, I wouldn't say maybe that Hirsch is the key to understanding women philosophers, because you know, the peculiarity of women philosophers contribution to me uh, is engaging their sensibility in different philosophical and non-philosophical fields, namely enhancing uh, senses, emotions, reality, and uh, yeah, and doing philosophy with humility. Uh, humility comes again from the Latin word humus, uh, in which in English is uh, down to earth. Uh, these women philosophers all give an original contribution. They all give an original contribution in their fields. And their point of strength is that maybe we can make a list of their contributions, but it would be impossible to understand their contribution without feeling 
it and leaving it. Mm, here, Hersch talks of miming. Mm, to mime, miming to Hersch uh, is about an experience. It is about action rather than pure theoretical knowledge. And this is really relevant to me. Mm. So uh, Hersch's contribution is just a testimony. As I said, uh, she is, of course, an exemplary testimony uh, rather than a key to understanding. Uh, she is a testimony among other women philosophers who all show us the real world that is beyond pure logical thinking, uh, a, a world that is made up of sensations, feeling, heterogeneous matter, limits. And these women philosophers show us the relevant role that this world can have in philosophical reflection. And to conclude, um, of course, this sensibility makes the force of women philosophers, especially, I would say, in our Western societies, because uh, recently mm, I am discovering Eastern philosophy uh, and my last research interest is uh, uh, exactly uh, intercultural dialogue. And um, I can see uh, that it is quite evident for Eastern people that here uh, in, the West, in Western societies that Western philosophy is grounded on a subjective bias. Uh, it is grounded on a subjective point of view um, which gives priority to... So uh, to conclude, uh, I think that, yes, of course, uh, the, this sensibility uh, makes the force of women philosophers, mm, especially in our Western, Western societies, because mm, recently I am discovering Eastern philosophy, and my last research interest is uh, exactly in intercultural dialogue. And I can see mm, that it is quite evident for Eastern people uh, that our Western philosophy is grounded uh, on a subjective point of view, on a subjective bias, uh, which gives priority to subjective will, to subjective reason, and to their power to modify their objects. Mm. I haven't enough time here to go deeper in this issue, uh, but I think that uh, the mainstream Western philosophy is mainly focused on a theoretical way uh, of doing philosophy from a subjective based point of view. So uh, women's philosophers sensibility can help us to resize our role in the world, uh, the capacities of our intellect, the capacities of our reason, the peculiarity of our will. They are all something unique in the world of course, but this unicity must interact with nature and with the rest of the world. Mm, our unicity, must enhance the world's beauty rather than compete with it. And Hersch says this perfectly. She says that we have to decrystallize the world. We have to make the world a more free space, fulfilling it with the testimony of our existence. Mm. This, of course, needs subjective reflections, uh, but it needs a practical engagement with the world as well. So yeah, women philosophers always remember this to us and this is their point of strength. Yeah, by hearing you talking about Hersch, I feel like one can not only read her, her, her main contribution, her main works, but one has to understand even her biography because it's, it seems to me that it is this in between, between her practical life, her life in general, and her uh, moral thinking on freedom, which makes this concept of freedom so more comprehensive, no? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, this happens with many existential philosophers and probably is also um, a key to me in my research. I often uh, start from the biography, from the personal events of their lives, uh, when I start studying new philosophers. But yeah, uh, when it comes to Hersch, it is particularly important. This is the reason why when I talk about her, when I present her at conferences, I start saying that uh, I work on a Hersch philosophy and the biography. I always stress this uh, conjunction uh, and because yeah, it is really relevant and peculiar to her. Yeah, and I think it's so important to do philosophy as an historian of philosophy by knowing exactly what is the, histo the historical context of the works and not only reading text without 
contextualize yeah, this is the reason why i went to zurich i mean uh, when i mentioned the personal documents uh, or maybe some notes from sorry, you have some notes from hersch uh, these notes these documents cannot go out from the central library of zurich so yeah uh, i i was forced to go there because this is, was the only way for for reading them but they are really relevant uh, so so yeah it is an essential passage everyone that wants to know um uh, better hash must go there and spend some months because it's really a lot of documents but uh, it's a, a time that is invested in a good way of course yeah exactly so for all those who have not yet read your book you divide the book into three large sections which can be confusing at first sight because you start with part one which is mentioned the inner freedom then part two the outer condition of liberty and at the end, the, the part three, the practical philosophy. What is the, um, the connection between the third part and the first two, which seem more connected than the third part, but now we understand already a little bit, but perhaps you can deepen a little bit more. And why do you distinguish between freedom and liberty? Are they in her, her two different concepts or are they synonymous or how do you feel about it? Yeah, well, these questions is connected to what we were just saying, and it lets me clarify some points. Thank you. Um, I think that it is quite clear now that Hersh's main object is freedom. Uh, Hersh has reflected on, uh, reflected on freedom uh, throughout her whole life, uh, going deeper and deeper in this object. Um, when we are faced with something new, uh, at first, we assess the actual existence of our object, and then we are attracted by its most evident characteristics, let's say at first sight. And then we get to know the object better and better from different angles, noticing even the most particular details. Well, I think this is a good similitude for understanding Hersh's moves and also for understanding the development of my book. Because first of all, Hersh was attracted by freedom and its general theoretical features. Mm, from the beginning of 1930s uh, to the end of the 1940s, uh, she tried to define theoretically freedom and the dynamics of its subjective use. And uh, this all uh, falls under the name of inner freedom, uh, which is a definition that Hersh uses in some texts. Uh, second, uh, once having given a general definition of her objects, um, Hersh was attracted by the other characteristics uh, which helped her to consider freedom also uh, in her in, in its intersubjective use. Mm, so from the beginning of the 1950s, uh, she reflected explicitly on politics uh, and she gave her essential contribution on the theorization of human rights um, until, well, the, the end of her life. Uh, also, thanks to her mandate uh, of, um, as a head of the Department of Philosophy at UNESCO uh, between 1966 and 1968. Um, thanks to such reflection uh, on politics and human rights, um, she theoretically investigated the outer conditions of liberty, which is, again, a definition given by Hersh. Um, third, uh, once having theoretically investigated the subjective and intersubjective use of freedom uh, already in the second half of her life, uh, Hersh decided to offer a practical testimony of how to use our freedom effectively. Uh, so she used her freedom for engaging in uh, relevant issues uh, over time. And uh, um, in this period, uh, you know, Hersh was already quite famous and uh, her opinion was really relevant in Switzerland. So she used this, uh, she engaged and contributed to politics, again, to human rights, education, medicine, technology, sciences, uh, always being coherent, but also giving new forms to her freedom. Mm, practical philosophy is a, a definition given uh, by an established researcher in her philosophy, uh, whose name is Francesca De Vecchi. Uh, she says that uh, Hersh offers us both a philosophical practice and a practical philosophy. Mm, once having elaborated a theoretical philosophical practice in the first half of her life, uh, mm, 
clarifying the dynamics uh, of freedom in ordinary life, uh, Hirsch developed this practical philosophy uh, in the second half of her life, as I already said, um, giving us some valid practical examples of how to engage our freedom. Um, I think now it's quite clear that to Hirsch theory is not enough. Um, in human existence, uh, theoretical practice must be incarnated in something concrete. Um, this is essentially what the third part of my book is about. Um, we can consider that uh, the three parts of the book are about three different perspectives, um, three different points of view, uh, which are all essential when dealing with freedom. And this also let me go a bit deeper uh, in her theory, uh, trying to explain the difference, the distinction between liberty and freedom. Um, to me, um, the relevance of practical philosophy, of course, is something peculiar to, uh, to Hirsch, and I have emphasized this, but uh, um, the real groundbreaking idea is a philosophical practice, this philosophical practice, and to me is, uh, well, fascinating um, or intriguing. Uh, it somehow recalls uh, the ancient philosophers and their attention to praxis, which then becomes uh, the habitus of Latin philosophers. Um, Hirsch says that there are a few moments in our life, uh, if we are lucky, uh, in which we glimpse the transcendent value in its wholeness. Um, in these moments, we are faced with what is most worthy for us. So it is exactly here that freedom coincides with necessity because we are forced to say yes to this worthy object and we have to give a form to this matter. Mm, Hersch called this kind of freedom existential freedom, mm, a freedom that decides the metaphysical truth, she says, of our existence, namely the values on which our existence is grounded. And um, she investigates this in the very first years of her research, especially in Illusion Philosophique, uh, which was published in 1936. Mm, but we have to take these kind of decisions just a few times in our life. So uh, here the real philosophical practice comes in, uh, in our daily life, uh, when we have to refine patiently uh, our existence, and uh, when we have to be faithful to, be ob to the objects decided with our existential freedom. Mm -hmm. In everyday life, uh, we have to take forms that are coherent with, with our metaphysical truth. We have to build our reality says Hersch. Uh, reality to Hersch is composed by the forms, by all of the forms uh, that give, that we give to all the worthy objects that we hold in the world. Uh, so in everyday life, we use what can be defined ontological freedom, um, namely a freedom that builds our existence on the basement decided um, by our existential freedom. Hirsch investigates this second type of freedom in the 1940s, especially in Lettres et la Forme in 1946. It was published in 1946. So uh, to sum up, the subjective use of freedom is determined by a philosophical practice made up of existential freedom and ontological freedom. And this all falls under the name of inner freedom in Hirsch. Mm, as I said, uh, knowing how to use one's freedom is not enough, since we also need some proper outer conditions of liberty. Uh, you know, uh, someone must guarantee that we have a free space for using our freedom. Otherwise, knowing how to use freedom is useless. Mm, we can look at what's happening in many parts of the world today. For example, in Iran, just to name one. Um, here, we are moving from a theoretical investigation to a practical investigation. Uh, we are now considering the actual, the real conditions that we need for using freedom. Mm. In order to use our freedom, says Hersch, we need a void space, an empty space which is preserved just for us. Mm. A void space that uh, we can fulfill with our decisions and form. And this space is liberty. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, you know, something really concrete uh, 
because even if it is a void space, uh, and uh, maybe this sounds a bit weird in Western tradition, um, liberty is something concrete that must be preserved by politics. And this is the reason why Hersch speaks of a third type of freedom, namely political liberty. Mm, I hope that this somehow answers uh, the questions about the distinction between freedom and liberty. But maybe we can say that freedom is the potential capability that we can use for giving form and incarnating. So it is a potential capability, while liberty is the actual void space that is preserved for us. So something potential against, we can say, something actual. Mm, of course, human rights plays an essential role in the preservation of such void space. But yeah, mm, clarifying this would take too much time. And if someone is interested, they can find it in the book. Um, maybe I can add just one last point uh, so that Hare's bigger plan can be finally clear. Mm, the reflection on the outer condition of liberty introduces a fourth kind of freedom. Uh, this is the last kind of freedom you can find in Ersh. And it is, again, a potential capability. Uh, and it is investigated in the reflection on human rights. Uh, Hersh says that politics must preserve an intersubjective, a social, political liberty. But of course, we have to respect also the other freedom on a subjective level. Um, Hersh says that this is a matter of recognition. Uh, because we have to consider that the other is free as much as us, uh, as I was previously say saying, of course. So Hersh speaks of a responsible freedom, and responsible freedom is probably uh, the point of arrival of the paradigm of freedom, uh, which can be derived from, uh, from Hersh's contribution. So when a free existence is responsible, it incarnates the forces that are worth it to it, while respecting, enhancing, and not den denying the freedom of the other. And yeah, I think that's all about Hare's theory on freedom. Yeah, many thanks. One last question of curiosity, of pure curiosity. Mm -hmm. When I was looking at Hersch and her and the research which is done on her, I found that there was a lot of work done by Italian writers and researchers. So I was wondering if there was one, uh, some connection point between her life or her philosophy and Italy, because it's so um, it's less unknown in France or Germany or Switzerland, I would even say, and it's a, a lot of work is done in Italy. Well, uh, this is all thanks to uh, the person that uh, did the most deep research on Janesh, uh, who helped me a lot during my PhD research. Uh, actually, she is uh, in Milan. Uh, she retired a few years ago. Uh, she is uh, Roberta de Monticelli. Uh, Roberta de Monticelli was uh, a student of Ersch uh, in Geneva. Uh, and then she, uh, she took her, her place because she taught uh, in Geneva for about 15 years, if I remember well. Uh, at the beginning of the 2000, I think until 2006, but I'm not uh, sure about the dates. But yeah, let's say at the beginning of, uh, the, the, of our century, um, Roberta de Monticelli with uh, Francesca De Vecchi, uh, who I already mentioned, Stefania Tarantino, and uh, uh, Roberta Guccinelli, uh, they all developed a, a PhD joint program uh, founded by the Swiss Fonds National um, about Janers. So they tried to cover uh, the most important topics in uh, Janers uh, philosophy. Uh, so this is the reason why in Italy Janers is really fam famous. It is uh, thanks to Roberta de Monticelli and to her students that uh, at the time they were a PhD students and then now that they are professor, uh, yeah, they are all professor in Milan and uh, in Naples. I think that Stefania Tarantino is in Naples right now. Yeah, so yeah, that... now, now there's me. And there is also another <laughs> student uh, from Pisa, I think, uh, Francesco Kello, uh, who, who developed the um, pedagogy in Janers. Yeah, so that's interesting to see that there was one 
one starting point in Italy to do to, to do research on John Hersch. That's so so amazing. So I would have uh, one question or even two for Christian Barth, if I may. Uh, you were the man behind the scene, so to say, as you had editing this book, and you are the main responsible for philosophy books at Schwab Verlag. Was it a novelty for you to work on a book that was only about a woman philosopher? Well, not quite. But before I respond to your question, let me first of all thank you for having me here. I find this an interesting setting to invite the editor, the author, uh, together to one interview and uh, discuss a new, a new book. Um, that's excellent. And I would also like to point out another thing about Pierre, Pierre Giacomo's work, because he wrote it on Hirsch in English. And this is a, a special challenge, because there's not much work on Hirsch out in English, right? So he had to do a lot of translation work or thinking about, well, how do you express things or Hirsch's thoughts in English? Perhaps for the first time, perhaps not for the first time, but there, it's, not, it's not determined in English how you express her ideas, how you translate her words and writings in English. So that's that's very impressive about Pier Giacomo's work, I think, apart from all the details of content and, and so forth. Um, no, it's, it's, it's not a new issue or not a new thing uh, for me to, to um, yeah, um, a work or work with authors who write on the women philosophers. But first of all, we, we brought out two volumes of uh, Hirsch's works already in 2020. Um, so it's a volume on her works on history of philosophy and theoretical philosophy on the one hand, and then a second volume on her writings on political philosophy. And if I'm not wrong, then one of the two volumes is in Pia Giacomo's cupboard, right? Yeah, indeed. This this red one, the critical edition from the critical uh, edition. Yeah. So know, those two yeah. exactly. So those two volumes they gather um, the most important of her works, and um, there we have some tradition of of publishing works of hers um, at Travel with Travel Publishing House, and I'm not the only man, the the only man or the only person behind the scenes because there is, for instance, also Monica Weber from the John Hersch. Um, society and uh, we have been cooperating closely for years now and she's really one of the strong persons in the background who keeps John Hirsch in, in the public's um, consciousness and, and uh, keeps keeps the researchers uh, attention um, or keep keep her at, at you know at the focus of, of at least some researchers uh, attention um, apart from that um, a book on Hannah Arendt will come out soon. Um, so we have also books on other women, women philosophers, of course. And apart from that, um, the whole discussion on the role of women in the history of philosophy, um, the critical discussions on the literature canons and curricula at universities and so forth, all these discussions um, are permanent permanent topic for me because um, we're also publishing the Grundriss der Geschichte der Philosophie, which is the largest work on the history of philosophy in German language. And the uh, first volume came out in 1983 and is still not completed. It will take many more years to complete the, the whole project. But it also means for us to, yeah, um, follow the discussions, the critical discussions, of course, also. On the, on the literature canons and the curricula and um, in order to, yeah, learn from those discussions, um, uh, use the insights from those discussions to do better justice to the role of women, women philosophers in the history, one history of human thinking in general, and to adapt our future editorial plans accordingly to give some more space to um, female persons um, in those upcoming volumes and um, also, yeah, keep um, an eye on the fact um, what the ratio between female and male authors, for instance, who are contributing to those volumes and so forth. So um, this is the general topic is, is one that is, yeah, um, I'm dealing with all the time, I, I can say. But. Yeah, so, so you think that uh, this new contribution, these new books in history of philosophy, 
especially turned to women mm -hmm. philosophers, mm -hmm. um, leads to rethink book series that you ha have at Schwabe Verlag and to open up a new space, like you mentioned it already, like sure. you speak to women philosophers. Sure. I think it's the starting point is now, it's right now, it's the most perfect time to do these things and to go go further. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Now, I've, um, at the back of my mind, I've been uh, thinking about a series on, um, yeah, um, female philosophers in the history of philosophy um, or in the history of human thinking in general. But it's not easy to found such a series because you need um, good partners to cooperate with. Um, who are working on um, those figures um, who are producing high quality work and um, that in a steady fashion. Um, so um, I would love to extend our program and to, to include one, one of those um, series dedicated to female philosophers or thinkers uh, in the history, um, of course. I, I know that for instance, uh, you at your center, you're covering with Springer and Brillen or you've, you've started a new, new journal on the history yeah. of- And the uh, Goethe, also. yeah. And the Goethe, yeah. why not with Schwabe? So. Perhaps you were not asked. <laughs> I was not asked. <laughs> exactly. Why wasn't I asked? <laughs> um, now, of course, I can only announce that I'm um, open to that and I would like, in fact, to have such a series. But on the other hand, I mean, uh, the, the number of researchers working uh, in this field is limited. And um, yeah, I cannot, I cannot write the books, right? <laughs> yeah, you can promote so, them, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can only promote it, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so we need more, more 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 work done, like Pierre Giacomo's work, exactly, to, exactly, to bring exactly. further this a reflection. Of years, maybe, <laughs> maybe that will get something new. <laughs> exactly. exactly, and exactly. who knows? Perhaps this interview gave even some taste to other philosophers to do research on female philosophers, and we will see some upcoming new break, uh, path breaking, new uh, new research would be would be great. So I would kindly. Uh, Thank you for this nice discussion mm -hmm. on Pierre Giacomo's mm -hmm. book um, and uh, for this uh, lovely discussion on the editing and uh, the ideas behind the book. Many thanks. Thank you, Jen. That was great. <laughs> <laughs>